All righty. All right. Well, again, it's good to see everybody here, my family. I love you all. Um, last week we talked, well, the last year we've been talking about the Gospel of Luke, haven't we? And I've been enjoying that. I mean, that's been really great for me. I hope it's been great for you. I hope you've learned some things. I hope you've grown. Have you grown? Have you grown? Have you grown through the study of the Gospel of Luke? Awesome. Um, tonight's going to be a little bit different, taking a break from that. Uh, do me a favor and grab a copy of God's Word and uh, turn to Romans chapter 6, please. Um, last week we talked about uh, our desire and God's desire is to accomplish something every time we gather, correct? And so, uh, are you, I don't know about you, are you, do you, do you want to accomplish something here tonight? I want to, I want to, I'm going to ask you guys some questions tonight, and, and I don't want any churchy answers. I want you to give me some low down, right, like real, genuine, I'm not asking questions hypothetically, and, and some churchy thing, like, I'm going to ask some questions, I, I kind of want, I want some answers, like, from the seats, okay, and not what you think I want to hear, but what, uh, what's on your heart. So, I want to accomplish something here tonight, and I know that God wants to accomplish something here tonight in and through you. He wants us to, to be sanctified. Remember we talked about that last week? Being sanctified, changed, right? We got saved, justified, then sanctified is the process of changing uh, to become more like Jesus Christ, our Creator, and we do that uh, each and every time we gather here by hearing the Word of God. The reason why we can do that, the reason why that works is because the Word of God is, is all of it, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching us the truth. Amen? And so that's why we preach God's Word here. And, and God's Word is His chosen means of communicating to His people who He is, who you are, and how we should live according to who He is. Amen? So, so that's what we want to do here tonight. Now, we're going to sit under the authority of God's Word, and uh, not necessarily under my authority. I'm just the messenger, and I've done my, my work this week, and I've prepared, and I've tried to listen the best that I can, and I've studied, and I'm going to give you what I have received. And so that's the best gif gift I could, I could give you. Uh, the Bible that we study each and every week, and if you go to a church that doesn't tell you to open a Bible, you should leave there. I'm just going to tell you that right now. Don't go to that church, okay? You don't need to hear about, uh, about my fish, and you don't need to hear about my camping trip. You need to hear from God, right? That's, that's how we accomplish something, and so uh, we read the Bible. Now, if you've read the Bible at all, you know it's kind of divided up into two distinct sections, and... Uh, that's the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so it's two kind of different sections, but let me just offer this to you, that it's one book with one author and many pens. Does that make sense? Yeah. One author. I just mentioned to you a minute ago that all Scripture, right? Hold up your Bible. Hold up your Bible. Come on now, don't be shy. All of that is God-breathed, right? It wasn't Paul-breathed. It wasn't James-breathed. It was God God breathed, right? And he taught them what to say. And so all of Scripture is God breathed. And so it's one book with one God. And some people have this feeling and this, this belief that the Old Testament's about the old God who's full of wrath and he'll smite you and, and, and plagues. And then over here in the New Testament is Sunday school Jesus God. Gentle, Fabio, love, grace, and that's it. Old God, new God, no. One God, one of my favorite verses in Scripture is Malachi 3.6. I am the Lord, I do not change. Amen. And that's why we study God's Word. And so this entire Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, interwoven as one message about a holy, unchanging, perfect God. And tonight, both Testaments are going to complement each other perfectly, okay? Uh, we're going to look, my plan is to go to the New Testament to learn some truth, and then we're going to go to the Old Testament to, to, to try to understand that truth, and then learn how to apply that truth, and they're going to work together as one. And I'm telling you something right now, I believe with all my heart, I believe people are going to be delivered from things tonight. Amen. I honestly believe that, like I'm getting fired up just because I know, see I know what's coming. 
And, and I think that God is going to deliver some people tonight with, this, with his word. I believe with all my heart. So let's do this. You guys at Romans chapter 6? Yeah. All right, okay. Let's stand up and acknowledge uh, the presence of God. He's going to invade the room in a powerful way through the reading of his word. I'm going to read 18 verses. It's not the only thing I'm going to read tonight, but it's the only time I'm going to ask you to stand. Are you guys ready? Yeah. All right. Here we go, Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? You guys can answer that. No. no. Exclamation mark. Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we join him in his death? For we died... And we're buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. Anytime you want to throw some, like, hallelujahs, you can multiply them. You guys didn't get that? Okay. You, Jessica got it. That's why she's the worship leader. Okay. Um... Your job is secure because no one else got it. Thank you, <laughs> oh, all right. Um, for we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. I'm oh, sorry. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. Come on. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead... This is an awesome place for an amen. You ready? For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master, for you, are no, longer, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realize that you become the slave? This is huge. Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God, once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. Awesome. God is good. Have a seat. Have a seat. Have a seat. I like it. That was good stuff right there. Hey, let me ask you guys a question. You're smart. You're smart. What's like the main, what's the, if you could wrap it up, what's the one thing that's being spoken of the most here? One word. What is it? Sin. Sin. Um, often neglected in the church. Not talked about much in the church. Uh, it's not going to, it's not, it's not popular to talk about sin in the church, uh, but it's, it's, it's talked about a lot in the Bible, and we're a Bible church, and we, we learn from the Bible, and so if it talks about it a lot, we have to talk about it, but uh, it's not like um, sin like as in you're rotten, and oh, you're a sinner, and you're terrible. It's not like the bad side of sin. It's actually the good side of sin, if you will. It's talking about that sin ha has died, and it's lost its power. 
that you've died to sin, that we've been set free from the power of sin, that Christ broke the power of sin, and we're dead to the power of sin, and sin is no longer your master, and you are free from your slavery to sin. This is a good part of sin that we're talking about, right? This is the good part. So, so let me ask you, what does all this mean to me, though? What does it, I mean, it was like an awesome section of Scripture for sure, but what does it mean to me? How does, it, how does a person live with these truths that we just read applied to our life? In other words, what's it look like for a Christ follower to be set free from the power of sin? It, it, what we just read with all the hoorah in the room can't just be biblical rhetoric. Like, it sounds awesome, but it has no substance. It has to be more than that. So let's talk about this. What is it like, what does it mean to be set free from the power of sin? When you do this for a living, you see a lot of sin. You see your own in the mirror every day, and that's frightening. And I don't like it. So that's, so like I'm working on my sin, you working on your sin? Are you working on your sin? I'm working on my sin too, right? You're all working on, but see, when you do this, I'm working on your sin too. <laughs> that's not fun. I can tell you that right now. It, it's not fun. It's not fun. But, 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 so you see a lot of sin, and so this is, this is, a, this is such a needed message, because, and that's why I'm saying there's going to be some people that get delivered from this tonight. We need to hear about this. There's some truth here that transforms lives. And, and if you'll embrace it, you're going to see some change in your life. Now, the first thing I want to talk about, before we get into like the meat of it, I want to rabbit trail for a second and talk, like not our subject matter tonight, but there is a truth about being set free from the power of sin that I, I can't neglect, okay? It's not our subject matter, but I, I can't ignore it. Now, do me a favor. Put your hand on the person next to you. Look them right in the eye and say, get ready. Come on now, get ready. This is going to be good. Come on, say it. This is going to be good. You ready? Roman, here's, here's, Romans 5.21, listen to this. You got fired up before. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's awesome news. That is incredible news. Now, now, what it means is that because of sin, because sin has entered into, human, into the human race, we're all destined for death in a place that the Bible calls hell. That's just the way it is. But as we just read in, in 521, that if you're in Christ, then the destiny that, that sin has reserved for you is no more. Right? It's no more. And, and so hence, sin's rule over you, if you will, right? Its power has died. It, it can't, it can no longer send you to the place that it had planned for you. And that's great news. But that's eternal news. And that's great. And if we just drop the mic now, that would be worth it. We could go home and we could rejoice and do the happy dance about what Jesus did for us. But that's not what we're talking about tonight. That's the eternal. I'm talking about there's more to this truth that we've been set free from sin. And, and this message tonight is for the here and now, okay? Not the eternal stuff. Not the forever. This is for the here and now because um, most likely all of us in this room are going to make it till tomorrow. Most likely. We may not. I, I don't know. But most likely, right? If you look at the odds, probably going to make it. So, so, so we got some stuff going on right now, right? Sin has, has broken its power. If you said yes to Jesus, you're not going to go to hell. You get to go to heaven. That's great. That's someday. I don't know when it's going to happen, but we've got some stuff here and now we got to deal with, don't we? Yeah. Anybody got some stuff they got to deal with? Yeah. Who sins in the room? Okay. So we've got a cancer amongst us, and we've got, to, we've got to send some chemo down in here to fix it, right? So let, here, remember I told you I was going to ask you some questions, and I want some real answers, okay? Think before, listen, when I ask you a question, don't just blurt out Jesus like it's Sunday school, 
Okay, you're not six. So, so let me ask you a question, honestly. Do you believe John 3, 3, 16, where it says, for God so loved the world, everyone, that he sent his son? Do, do you, yes? Okay. Do you, do you believe that he sent him so that he could die on the cross? And if you believe in that, you wouldn't perish, but you'd have everlasting life. Do you believe all that? You do believe that. Okay. Do you believe um, that, that the nation of Israel left Egypt and got to the Red Sea and God did his God thing and the water opened up and Israel passed through is, and Egypt tried and it came in and flooded and killed them? Do you believe that? Yeah. Okay, you do. Awesome. Do you believe Ephesians 1.13? where it says that if you exercise the gift that's offered in John 3.16, if, you, if you've said yes to Jesus, Ephesians 1.13 says that his Holy Spirit is now residing in you. Do, you. do you believe that you received the Holy Spirit when you said yes to Jesus? Let me hear. Yeah. You do. Okay, awesome. Do you believe Philippians 2.9 and 10 that says that, that um, every at the name of Jesus, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Now that might be like before it's too late, which would be good. It might be for some after it's too late, but everyone on earth from the time of Adam and Eve to the very last second here on this place that everyone, everyone will notice, hey, there's the king, his name is Jesus, and they'll do that. Do you believe that? Yes. Okay, you do. Awesome. Why do you believe that? I'll offer this to you. Because it's in the word of God. How many people were at the Red Sea? Any of you? No. You weren't. You weren't there when, when, when John 3.16 was quoted. Written. Who was walking around with Jesus back then? You weren't. I wasn't. We believe that it's true because it's in the word of God. And that's why we study it here. Do you know that the word of God, according to the, God, to the uh, Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 2.15, he calls the word of God the word of truth. He calls it the word of truth. So since the word of God is the word of truth, right, then that means what the word of God says about sin is what? True. True right? You believe all this stuff about the scriptures, and so whatever it says about sin is true. So Romans 6, 1 through 18 is true. So why do you still struggle with sin? Why did every hand go up in this room? That's a problem. Would you agree? That's a problem. It's a big problem. Let's get a definition on, 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 the, on the screen for a second, because we're going to talk about sin. Let's melt it down to its basic element. It's this. It's to trespass. It's to go where you don't belong. It's to say what, you're, what you were told not to say. It's to think what you were told not to think. God says, don't go here, and you do it anyway. That's what it is. You've trespassed. You went where you don't belong. That's what sin is. So, we struggle with sin even though God's word, which is what? True. Says that we're free from the power of sin, but yet we still sin every single day. Okay, we heard the truth in Romans 6, right? Now let's do me, do me a favor. Go to the book of Judges, and we're going we're gonna to see, we're gonna help, that's going to help us understand the truth of Romans 6. It's going to help us apply it. So we can get on top of this thing. So maybe we can start seeing some of these hands go down. Right? Judges chapter, chapter 6. I'm sorry, ju Judges chapter 1. It's the sixth book of the Bible. In case you're wondering where it is, I want you to look at it. Don't just assume that what I'm telling you is the truth. I say it all the time. I used to sell cars. Don't listen to me. <laughs> get a Bible. Judges chapter one, and, and I want to read there uh, in verse 21. It's after Joshua. So while I'm turning, let me give you a little backstory. So, so uh, you guys know Moses, right? 
not me, but the, the real one. The, you know, I'm, I'm real. You know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> the Charlton Heston one. You know what I'm talking about. So, so you know about Moses, right? And he's got, you know, the burning bush, Ten Commandments, all that kind of stuff. And, and, and God's like going to use him to lead the people out of Egypt and go to the promised land where he's, he said, this is the way I want you to live and this is the way I want you to worship. And, and I'm going to give you a place where you can go do that. It's going to be rocking and awesome. And, and there's not going to be any other God. It's going to be me and you do it my way and it's going to be great. And, and so then he dies and, and, he, and, and God appoints Joshua and Joshua's the same awesome guy, and he's a great leader, and, and he's going to bring them finally into the promised land where they're going to set up their cities and, and have their home, and it's going to be incredible. And, 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 and so what God says is, is when you get there, like this land's not yours. This land, it actually belongs to someone else right now, these Canaanites, but, but I, I'm going to give you this land just to show you my, the, my favor. I'm going to show you how much I love you and how kind I am to you. I'm going to give you this awesome spot of land. And I want you to park it right there and make your nation right there. And so I want you to do is I want you to get rid of all those people in there. And, and some of us will say, oh, here's, here it is. Here's the old God. Because he's like, I want you to go in there and I want you to wipe them all out. Kill them, drive them out of there, whatever you got to do, just get rid of them because I'm giving you this place to live so you can live freely as I have commanded you to do so. So I'm going to read here. Um, this, is, this is what's happened. They've got to the, to the, uh, to the border. They start to move in. They're going to take over these territories. And listen, before I read it, I just want to say I'm not the smartest guy in the world right? And, and there's a lot of funky names and funky names of towns. And when I get to one I can't understand or read, I'm just going to go blah, 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 and you're going to have to deal with it, okay? So that's just the way it is. So here we are. We're in uh, Judges chapter 1. I'm going to start in verse 21. I'm going to read all the way to chapter 2, verse 3. You ready? Okay. Um, well, actually, I'm going to go to 19 first, okay? The Lord was with the people of Judah, and they took pose possession of the hill country, but they failed to drive out the people living in the plains who had iron chariots. The town of Hebron was given to Caleb as Moses had promised, and Caleb drove out the people living there, who were descendants of the three sons of Anak. The tribe of Benjamin, however, failed to drive out the Jebusites, who were living in Jerusalem. So to this day, the Jebusites live in Jerusalem among the people of Benjamin. The descendants of Joseph attacked the town of Bethel, and the Lord was with them. They sent men to scout out Bethel, formerly known as Luz. They confronted a man coming out of the town and said to him, Show us a way into the town, and we will have mercy on you. So he showed them a way in, and they killed everyone in the town except that man and his family. Later the man moved to the land of the Hittites, where he built a town. He named it Luz which is its name to this day. The tribe of Manasseh failed to drive out the people living in <laughs> and all their surrounding settlements because the Canaanites were determined to stay in that region. When the Israelites grew stronger, they forced the Canaanites to work as slaves, but they never did drive them completely out of the land. The tribe of Ephraim failed to drive out the Canaanites living in Gezer. So the Canaanites continued to live there among them. The tribe of Zebulun failed to drive out the residents of Kitron, Nahalal. So the Canaanites continued to live among them. But the Canaanites were forced to work as slaves for the people of Zebulun. The tribe of Asher failed to drive out the residents of, you know, a bunch of them. Instead, the people of Asher moved in among the Canaanites who controlled the land for they failed to drive them out. Likewise, the tribe of Naphtali failed to drive out the residents of, there we go. Instead, they moved in among the Canaanites who controlled the land. Nevertheless, the people of Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath were forced to work as slaves for the people of Naphtali. And as for the tribe of Dan, the Amorites forced them back into the hill country and would not let them come down into the plains. The Amorites were determined to stay in Mount, whatever, all of them, okay. But when the descendants of Joseph became stronger, they forced the Amorites to work as slaves. The boundary of the Amorites ran from Scorpion Pass to Selah and continued upward 
from there. Okay, I, I'm going to stop actually right there. <clears throat> what you're going to see here is, um, let me just say this. God said, get rid of those people because they practice things that I don't want you to practice. And they worship gods that I don't want you to worship. And if you let them stay there, they're going to infect you. So get rid of them. That was the clear call of God to his people before they went into the land. Get rid of them. Because it's going to affect you negatively. So here's four things about sin. And you can see, you're going to see it come clear and clear and clear as the night progresses. You're going to see Romans 6 become Judges chapter 1. Here's the first thing about sin. And this is, this is right here is a picture of sin. He didn't want them to sin. And he knew that these people, if they were left there, it was going to cause them to sin. So here's the first thing about sin as we desire to live without sin because we've been set free from it, right? Here's the first thing about sin. You have to know this. You have to do it. Sin, one, you have to acknowledge it. You have to acknowledge See, most people project sin. It started way back. It's that woman you gave me. Right? Adam and Eve. It's the woman. No, you stupid idiot. You, you bit the fruit. She didn't make you. She offered it, and you, and you ate it. Take the blame. Right? And he didn't take the blame. And most of us are like that. It's easier to say, Herb, it's your fault than to say it's mine. Because then I, I don't have to do anything. It's his problem now. And that's what we do. We, 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 we deflect, we project blame. We also dilute it. Oh, it's not that big of a deal. Right? I, I'm not as bad as him. Sorry, you're new. You'll probably never come back now. Awesome. <laughs> big time sinner right there. Love you, man. It's not as bad as his, or it's not as bad as it used to be. Like, that's awesome that it's not as bad as it used to be, but that's not an excuse to sin what you're sinning right now. Amen. Right? We, we dilute it. We, we brush it under the carpet like it's no big deal. Oh, it's just a little white lie. What did God say in the Ten Commandments? Don't lie. He didn't say don't make big lies. He didn't say don't make little lies. He didn't say white, black, purple, or red lies. He said don't lie. Oh, it's just a little white lie. No, it's not. It's an affront to a holy and perfect God. Right. We don't lie. And that's what we do. But we have to acknowledge it, you see? We have to acknowledge it. And, and that's exactly what happens here. God is, is adamant about these people realizing that it was them. Look, look here in chapter 2, uh, verse 11. It says that the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight and served the images of Baal. They abandoned the Lord. I'm sorry, I messed up. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Hold on. Go back to verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 2. I'm sorry, verse 2. He says, For your part, you were not to make covenants with the people living in this land. Instead, you were to destroy their altars, like kill their way of life and their way of worship because it's going to affect you. But look what it says. But you disobeyed my command. You disobeyed my command. Why did you do this? Now look, so now I declare that I will no longer drive out the people living in your land. There will be thorns in your sides and their gods will be a constant temptation to you. See, we need to personally, just like God made it clear to them, we too need to personally acknowledge our own sin. If we will personally acknowledge our own sin, then we can start to have some victory over it. You know, the Bible says, Romans 3.23, we all have sinned. James chapter 3, verse 2, we all fail in many ways. 1 John 1.8, if we claim to have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. And, you know, I got to say one thing. I got to give you guys credit for something. When I said, who sins in here, you all raised your hand. So you're living, <laughs> you're living in the truth. At least you understand that you're sinning. You know, like this guy here that's being referred to that says, hey, I don't have any sin. I'm good. No, that person is fooling themselves and is not living in the truth. Listen, we all have sin, every single person on earth. And some of it makes the news. And it's really super bad, and some of it does not. It's very, very private. 
but we have it. The entire human race is infected. And when you realize this and acknowledge your own personal sin, that's when God can start working in your life. Let me ask you a question. Why were the, why were the, the other nations that were there, the, the Canaanites and Jebusites and all that, why were, were their gods and their practices negatively affecting the nation of Israel? Was it those other nations' faults? Was it God's fault? Or was it their fault? It was their fault. They allowed this to happen. They trespassed, didn't they? God said, do this. And they said, no. And they disobeyed him. And that's why it says this constant temptation, a constant thorn in your side. You ever realize that you've got this constant temptation to sin? That you have this, re that, that all of us in this room have something that we're guilty of repeatedly, over and over and over again. We think we have victory over it, but we come back to our default sin. Raise your hand. Come on. All of us do. Everyone has it, right? That's why. You just saw it right there in God's word. Because you disobey what God says, you're going to have this constant thorn in your side. Why can't I stop doing this? You get so mad at yourself. Why, why, why? Because you're circumventing the system. You're not doing what God says to do to get rid of the thorn. That's why. But you're going to be delivered here tonight. Amen? You're going to be delivered here. Listen, they gave these people, they gave sin a foothold. They gave it a foothold. Ephesians 4.27 speaks of this, giving the enemy a foothold. You know, a foothold is like letting your guard down. There's a kink in the armor. There's a hole in the wall. There's a subtle relaxing of conviction. A subtle relax relaxing of obedience. And here comes sin. I've watched it in this church wonderful men and wonderful women that have a hole in the wall and they didn't plug it and here comes the serpent and it happens too much yeah. we need to cut the head off that stinking snake yeah. and end this yeah. and win we give them a foothold you know what a foothold is here's the definition it's a position from which further progress may be made why would you give sin a place to progress? No one would raise their hand and say, I want to, right? But we do. We give it a place in our life where it can set up camp and look for places to invade you. That's what we do. And when we allow that to happen, sin and the enemy, it goes from a foothold to a stronghold. A stronghold, the definition is a little bit different. A stronghold is a place that has been fortified so as to protect it against attack. It becomes a part of your life that you can hardly get rid of, no matter what you do. That's the default sin that you guys are ra we're, we're raising your hand to. That's that fortified area over time, repeated over and over again. It's like a habit. You're so good at it that it, it starts to come naturally to us. And I'm victim to that as well. We have to acknowledge our sin. I'm going to skip my notes here and I want to read something to you. I was about to read it a second ago. See what happened was we're talking about a foothold to a stronghold, right? See what happens? Watch this. They didn't kick them out. They disobeyed my command of driving them out, killing them, getting rid of them because they're going to affect you. Why would you do this? So now I declare that I will no longer drive out the people living in your land. There will be thorns in your side, that sin of yours, and their gods will be a constant temptation to you. And here's what happens when you give sin a foothold. It becomes a stronghold, and that's what I was about to read you. Chapter 2, verse 11, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. They let sin in. They let the enemy stay and infect them. And because of it, look what it says that happened. They didn't just flirt with it. Now look. 
They did what was evil in the Lord's sight and served the images of Baal. They abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who brought them out of Egypt. They went after other gods, worshiping the gods of the people around them. That's exactly what God said would happen. And that's exactly what they ended up doing because they gave sin a foothold in their life. And it became a stronghold. It wasn't just flirting anymore. It was full-blown idolatry at this point. It says they had abandoned God. They said, to heck with you, Jesus. I'm gonna go worship uh, Allah. That's what, that, that's what happened right there. And that's exactly what happens when we let the little white lies of sin into our life. You know, it's really, really impossible to get to the pit of hell without taking the first step. Do you know that? You gotta take the first step in the staircase to get to the bottom. So what we're talking about tonight is avoiding the first step. Let's avoid the first step. Anyone in on that? Yeah. I'm totally in on that. So the first thing is we have to acknowledge our own sin, okay? Don't put it off, don't project it, don't, don't sweep it under the rug, don't say it's not that big of a deal. We need to make holiness a big deal. Do you know God said to be holy as I am holy? He didn't say be sort of holy. He didn't say be holier than you were last week. He didn't say be holier than Ricky. What did he say? He said be holy as I am holy. Do you know how holy God is? God is so holy that if you were to look at him, you would burst into flames. That's how holy he is. And that's what he wants you to be like. So I think we should take our sin a little more seriously than we do. Okay, here's the second thing about sin. And, and this is what, we, we make it, a, we give it a foothold and then this is what we do and it's so wrong. We manage it. Listen, don't, man, don't try to manage sin. You, you, can't, you can't manage sin, okay? Let, let, me, let me, here in Judges, Manasseh, Zebulun, Naphtali, and Dan failed to drive out the Canaanites as God instructed. So instead, they thought they could just control them, right? By, by giving the illusion of control, by making them their slaves, right? I'm gonna, that's what a slave is, right? Slave, I, I'm the master, and you're my slave, and I control what you do. See, what God was saying is this person, this person, this, these people are going to cause you to sin. They have some power, kind of, and, and now you think you're going to have this illusion of control by making them your slave? Yeah, that, that's, <laughs> if they're slaves, then I have control. Error, right? That's an illusion at best, at best. Do me a favor. Look back in verses 32 and 33. They thought they had control. But what did it say? The Canaanites, comma, who had control of the land. They didn't have any control. They thought they did because they made them their slaves, but they had no control. And it's evident because look at the result. You're my slaves. I'm gonna control who you are. But yet, it's funny, I ended up serving your gods. How'd that happen? I thought I was the boss. I thought you were my slaves. Well, how did you end up influencing me when I was supposed to be the one influencing you? You have, because we have no power like that. You let the sin in, you lose. Bottom line. These Canaanites were given a foothold when Israel didn't obey God and drive them out. And this foothold became a stronghold in their life. And they weren't flirting anymore. Now it was full-blown idol worship. They had abandoned God. And let me tell you something. Everyone in this room is Israel. We're all Israel. Every single one of us, myself included. I'll tell you why. God said, sin is dead and you are free. That's what he said, right? Do you acknowledge that? We read it. That means we get to choose who our master is. That means we can choose to wholeheartedly obey God. That, that when, when God said that sin no longer has power over you, that you can make the decision to not let it. But we don't. But we don't. 
I'm gonna walk where angels dare to tread. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about something super sensitive. And uh, I want you to give me grace, but I believe with all my heart completely. And you know what, let me rephrase that. My heart is wicked. I believe that based on what God's word says, that it's true and I have to tell you, okay? Um, I don't believe culture. I don't. Culture changes all the time, you know? It changes from town to town. It changes from ethnicity. It changes from nation to nation. It changes from decade to decade. You, you guys know, I mean, in the last 10 years, you see what's happened? I mean, our world has completely changed. In just a matter of, what, 30 years? We've got this thing, the internet now. I can talk to someone like James Bond on my phone who's in Africa yes. right now. That's crazy, right? Culture changes and, and, and shifts so frequently all the time. And so I don't believe it. Because if what's true to the people in this country on this day is completely untrue to the, to the next generation in that same country. So what's the truth? And, and if this is true for this people over here in this country, but then you go over to this country over here and they believe completely something different. So what is, what's the person supposed to do? So that's why I don't believe in culture. That's why I believe God. Malachi 3.6, right? I am the Lord and I do not change. That's what I need. I don't even like when I come home and my wife moves a piece of furniture. That drives me insane. Guys, come on. Right? I'm the Lord and I don't change. I don't believe feelings or opinions either because in a matter of an hour, our feelings can change. And, this, and guess what? When it comes to opinions, there's seven billion people on the earth. So who's right? So I can't believe feelings or opinions, but I believe the word of God because it says heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God will last forever. And I need that. So um, I believe that just like Israel, we too here in this room, we give sin a foothold when we try to manage it. Okay, uh, let's talk about some uh, often repeated um, offenses, some often repeated trespasses. We all raised our hands. Things like uh, drinking and drugs and pornography and, and outbursts of anger and, and, and overeating and cussing and smoking and all these things that the world would call what? What are they? No, the world doesn't call it sin. What do they call it? Addictions right? Am I making anything up? It's what the world calls those things, addictions, right? Now, the reason why I, I'm saying this is because, I, and I told you, I believe the Word of God, and I don't believe culture, and I don't believe feelings and emotions, and I don't believe any of your opinions, and I don't believe my opinion, because I'll tell you what my opinion means. My mom would say it in Yiddish, bupkis, Bupkis. That means duty, nothing, zero. That's what my opinion means. Nothing, right? I am, a, I am but a vapor on this world. Here today, gone tomorrow, soon forgotten, but God's word stands forever, and you guys all agreed with loud shouts that it's the truth, right? It's the truth. So we call these things addictions, right? Well, I did a little research this week, and you know, the word addiction or any form of it, addicted, addictions, whatever, it's only used one time in all of Scripture. And as a matter of fact, the word addiction is never used. Not, God does not speak of addictions ever in God's Word. Never. It does say one thing about addicted. Um, and I'd like to... Uh, talk to you about that tonight. And I think this is going to, listen, um, God's word says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of the world. Amen. But let, you got to let, you got to let God change you. That's what we came here to do, right? To accomplish something. 
Let God change you into a new person by changing what you think. And what the world tells you is that all these things on the list that you raise your hand to, that you keep doing over and over again, they're addictions. Let me share with you a little something about God's word, what he has to say about it. The one time the word, it's addicted, and it's used once. 1 Corinthians 16, 15, you can jot it down. You won't see it in the New Living Translation because that's a terrible translation on this verse. But in the King James Version, it says this, that this man Stephanus and his family addicted themselves to the work of the ministry. They addicted themselves to the work. Most of the translations won't say addicted. They say devoted to, right? The word is the Greek word tasso. It is to to addict, to devote, to assign, appoint, ordain, to set or dispose one's self to something, right? It's, it, this is where you got to let God deliver you right here to change the way you think, okay? Stephanus, he addicted himself to the work of the ministry, right? He, he chose to do this on his own. He was not forced. He was not controlled. He chose. He said, this is what I will do. This is what I will not do. And the part of the definition of tasso is to ordain, to set, to devote, to addict in an orderly way manner. I decide that I'm doing this, and I decide that I'm doing that. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever, do you ever known an addict? Is their world in orderly manner, or is it chaos, right? It's a nightmare. That's not addicted. Addicted is what you choose to do in an orderly manner. That's what addiction is. You choose what you will serve, Someone's got to say amen and yell or something up in this joint. Amen. God said I'm free. Yes. Romans 6. Go back there. It's a little different than what the world teaches you, isn't it? Yeah. Romans 6, 11 and 12. So you should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Now, I'm going to ask you guys a question. If you're addicted to something and it controls you, why would the, the, the word of truth, the creator of heaven and earth who does not lie, tell you don't do something if you cannot make that decision? Is he a liar? Why would he tell you to stop doing something if you were physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually incapable of making that choice? Is he a liar? It's not a liar. And this is where you need to let God change the way you think. Amen. And when you start to change the way you think, you will start to change the way you live. Yes. If you don't believe you can climb Mount Everest, right, you wouldn't go buy the gear and set a plan. You have to believe that you can climb that sucker before you'd go over to Bass Pro Shops and start buying tents, wouldn't you? What a fool would go buy the stuff knowing all along, I can't climb this mountain. I'm just stupid, and I want to spend a bunch of money. No, you wouldn't do that unless you first believed that you could climb that mountain, right? And you have to believe that God said you are free from the power of sin and that you could choose not to sin anymore, that you can addict yourself to sober, sobriety. That you can addict yourself to not looking at porn. That you can addict yourself to the work of the ministry. Stephanus did it. Is he any different than you? No, he's not. 
and patches and pills and classes and cutting back and limiting access and I'm Moses and I'm an alcoholic. That's us trying to manage our sin. Proverbs 23, 7 says, as you think, so you are. So why would you walk into a room and say, after not drinking for 22 years, I'm Moses and I'm an alcoholic? Stupid. Amen. So, so let me ask you a question. Culture and, and AA and feelings and your history and everyone around you and your past says you're an alcoholic. So, so am I an alcoholic or am I free? Which is what God says. What's the truth? Free. I'm free. Yes. You have to believe it before you can see it. Yes. You have to believe that you're free. He, listen, it's not rhetoric. We talked about this. God's word's not rhetoric. He's not making up some cool story that sounds good. The, the fact that, you, that, that, that Christ has killed sin in your life is just as powerful as, and true as his resurrection. Yeah, right? It's no different than thou shalt not commit adultery. It's no different than thou shalt not murder. It's no different than, 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 than stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. It's no different. You believe all that stuff, right? So why don't you believe this? <clears throat> God's not a liar. <clears throat> so we need to acknowledge our sin and we don't need to manage our sin. But here's what we need to do. We don't need to manage it and try to control it. Let me ask you a question. What's stronger The spirit that raised Christ from the dead, the same spirit that inspired the writers of scripture to write the Bible that you say is, is true, what's stronger, that or this? Spirit. Yeah. The spirit. spirit of God. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Do you believe Ephesians 1.13? I baited you. You said you believe it. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is in you. Amen. And you let this own you. Why? I'm not shunning you. I love you. And I want to see you delivered. And this is the hard conversation that churches don't have. Here's the truth. This is not stronger. How many days have you been quit? Three. Awesome. <clears throat> Who wants to quit tonight? Who wants to quit tonight? Anyone? Nobody? Who wants to quit tonight? Awesome. Awesome. The, God's word that guides this man's life. I know you, dude. <laughs> that God's word guides this man's life, and God's word told you that sin no longer has a hold on you. So listen, we don't, we don't need to, to cut back. We need to take those cancer sticks and flush them down the damn toilet. That's what we need to do. That's what we need to do. That's how we control sin, right? We don't manage it. We eliminate it. We eliminate it. That's what we do, okay? We eliminate sin, what happens if you don't drive it out completely? What happens if we just kind of, well, you know, we'll just cut back? Well, if we just cut back, we saw what happens in Judges, right? Yeah. If we just cut back, then it's going to be a constant thorn in our side. And it's going to be a constant temptation to go back there and pick them up, right? Right? So, so if, you're, if you're addicted to, 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 to pornography, you don't go to strip clubs and start your ministry there. If, if, you're, if, you're, if you've been drinking like a, a Viking and a pirate like Johnny Depp for the last 30 years, you don't quit drinking today and then go and do bar ministry with waiters and waitresses and cocktail waitresses. That's not smart, right? You run from those places and you never go back there. That's what you do. That's what you do. You don't, you, you don't put a, a, a pack of smokes on your dashboard, I've heard this, as a reminder of what I'm trying to quit. Really? I'm trying to quit. 
I don't want to eat chocolate cake anymore, so I'm going to put one right in front of my face the entire day and say, I'm not going to eat you. I'm not going to eat you. I'm not going to eat you. And before you know it, you're like freaking cookie monster, right? <laughs> you need to get rid of it. Amen. Now, right? Any change in life needs to be big and it needs to be now. Yeah. I know myself, if I don't do it now, I'm done. I'll forget. Thank you, my love, for reminding me. <clears throat> so we want to eliminate sin. You know, it, said, it says here that these guys were going to be a constant thorn in their side and a constant temptation to you. See, it was their very presence and practices that would cause Israel to stumble. And so God told, it, told them with, under no uncertain terms to eliminate them, to kill them, to drive them out completely because just the very presence of the enemy would control Israel. You see? It would control them. But one tribe after another, you saw it in the text, right? As a matter of fact, eight times it says that they failed to drive them out. And what happened? They were a constant thorn. They were a constant temptation in their life. And it's the same with us. We flirt with sin. We try to manage our sin. We pretend it's not there. We lessen it's no big deal. That's all a mistake. We can't do that. God says to be done with it that you're free. That's what he said. And uh, Don't you know that you become a slave to whoever you choose to obey? Isn't that awesome? You know, in, in, in our world, in our history books, we look at what's the two most famous slavery eras. You know, it was Egypt, of course, right? And then here in our country, which is awful. But it's, it's true, right? So, so, so the, the, the Israeli people, they went over there and, and, and Egypt made them their slaves, forced them, right? You know what it says? It's amazing. It says that Israel was growing so strong that Egypt needed to do something real quick because they would have become so strong that they wouldn't have been able to control them anymore. And stupid Israel, they should have reckoned, hey, listen, we're, we don't need to be your slaves. We could have rose up and done something about it, but we didn't. They said, you're going to be our slaves. Okay. Why? The Bible says you get to choose who you obey. That, see, we, we talk about addictions that they somehow control you. But God, who is the truth, said you have the, you have the power to choose who's going to control you. Amen. Like, you, listen, I ask you again, do you believe God's word? Yes. Do you believe it more than what you feel? more than what you see. It's the truth. And unless you believe that it's the truth, you'll never see it come to pass in your life. <clears throat> Do not let sin reign in you. Listen, if you watch porn on your phone, find a friend. Don't say, well, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to watch it anymore. I'll, 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 you know, I'll be better. No. Eliminate it. That means you give the phone to a buddy and you let them password protect the phone with a code you don't know so you can't look at. If you have a past history of weakness and you've chosen to obey this, this draw towards pornography, right? if you don't get rid of it, what happens? You see it. It's a constant thorn. It's a constant temptation. So get rid of it. Eliminate it. That's what it says, right? Eliminate it. So get the phone in someone's hands and let them help you with that. If you can't stop drinking, you've been drinking like crazy, don't just say, well, I'll just have a few. I'll just have, you know, I won't drink vodka. I'll just have a glass of wine. I'll just, I'm just doing beer. Or I'll just do it when, I'm, when it's social. I'm just going to have a drink with dinner. No, eliminate it, right? You can't have 10 drinks and get hammered unless you have the first drink, right? Do we all agree with that? Yes. Listen, I'm speaking from experience, man. I loved to drink. 
So, so when I stopped drinking, it wasn't like I'm just going to flirt with it and I'm okay now. This is 15 years in, and I've eliminated it from my life because I know I like to do it. I'm prone to it, and if I give it a foothold, it will become, once again, a stronghold. So I made a commitment to eliminate it, and I don't even take NyQuil because it has alcohol in it. So I will suffer and deal with a stupid cold because I refuse to take alcohol to my lips because I made a commitment to God. Do you know how easy it is? I'm not going to get drunk off NyQuil. Do you know how easy it is to just cave on that conviction? I got the flu. I feel like crap. How easy it would be to just take NyQuil and make myself feel better. Right? We've all been there. But I don't need to do that because I eliminated that. I made the choice to eliminate that from my life. I believe God. And like I said before, if you smoke, don't cut back. Don't patch. Throw the freaking things in the trash. This little thing is not stronger than the spirit of God that raised Christ from the dead. Amen. Right? That's awesome power. And that power lives inside of you. <clears throat> this is terrible, but... You know, there's this one thing that kills that power. That power, that, that Holy Spirit that lives inside of you, that's awesome power. There's one thing that just crushes that power. It's two words. Yeah, but. It's yeah, but. And we're guilty. God says this, yeah, but. But AA says that, and and God says this, yeah, but, he, but my situation, and, and I, and, yeah, but, let me tell you something. Excuses are accusations. That's what they are. Romans 6, 7 says that for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin, right? That's what it says. Yeah, but excuses are accusations that Christ somehow isn't enough. Excuses are accusations that, that what Christ did on the cross is somehow insufficient for your deliverance. Right? Isn't that what we're saying? Like, you don't say it out loud. You don't say, yeah, God, you, you, you went to the cross, you forgave me, I get heaven, but you can't help me, quit drinking. Like, you don't say it out loud, but when you yeah, but God's word, that's exactly what you're doing. You're saying, God, you're not enough. You're not strong enough. No, God, it's not finished. Choose, son and daughter. Choose to obey God and eliminate sin. Listen, choose holiness over your PC. I heard another pastor say it once. If you're watching porn and you want to get rid of that addiction, take a sledgehammer to your friggin' computer. I can't. It costs 500 <laughs> Really? 500 bucks, Or something that could just grip you and make you abandon God and send you into hell forever? What, what's, what's, what's more important? <clears throat> So we acknowledge it, we don't manage it, we eliminate it, and, and here's the thing though, we can't just eliminate it, that's, that's good, but there's, there's a four-step process, and I, I just want to touch this with you briefly um, before we conclude our time together here tonight, and thank you for letting me do this. Amen. Nobody's throwing anything at me. Amen. I think God's delivering people here tonight, I do, I believe it with all my heart, I do. I think it's one of the best nights we've ever had in this church. I'm excited about it. Yeah, come on. Here's the, here's the last of sin. Repla replace it. Um, both Matthew and Luke, two of the four gospel writers, uh, both tell of this teaching um, that Jesus taught about replacing. And, and it's, 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 it's about, you know, the, the, like there's a house. It's a, it's, a, it's a picture of like a house and then it's filled with like demons. And let's just equate these sins with the demons in us, the evil that's inside of us that's 
causing us to do this. So the fact that we're actually doing it, that the act of sin itself is demonic, right? That's not of God. God doesn't want you to get all drunk, does he? He doesn't want you smoking a bunch of cancer sticks into you. He doesn't want you getting drunk and high and watching porn. He doesn't want you to do all those things. Those aren't of God, right? Say amen. amen. They're not of God. Who are they from? That comes from hell. Let's just call it what it is, right? And he doesn't want those things in our life. And so the story goes that, that, that when, the, when we get rid of the demon, so we've eliminated it now, right? We, we've eliminated, we eliminated the smoking, we eliminated the porn, we eliminated the, the drinking, and we eliminated the, the, the outbursts of anger. We did, we did all these things that were sinful before, but we've eliminated that. And the story goes on in both accounts that the demon is kicked out, and he's over here, and there's this house, and it's been cleaned. And then he looks back, and he's like, no. Oh. That looks kind of nice now. Wasn't like that when I was there. It's nice and clean now. Swept clean. Looks like a nice place to hang out. Hey, guys! Right? And he goes and he grabs, what, seven more. And they go right back in. And what was bad before is now worse. It's the idea of a spiritual vacuum. You can't just get rid of... Listen, because what happens? If, if, if you go out every Friday night over to Fat Cats and you get drunk. That's what you do. What happens if you decide to eliminate that? You, you say, you know what, Lord, you, you said that sin is no, no longer has any power over me, so no more to drinking. I'm done. Awesome. I'm not going to Fat Cats now. That's great. What are we going to do now? I've been drinking at Fat Cats every Friday night for the last three years. What the heck am I going to do now, right? you got to replace it with something. Because what happens, right? Eventually, you start getting a little bored. Your buddies stop calling. They're still sending you pictures of all the fun that they had. And you're like, well, I could just manage it. I'll just go hang out with them, but I won't drink. Next thing you know it, chug, 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 right? You got the funnel out. You're back in high school, just like that. That's what happens. So you have to replace it with something because there's a void in your life. And if you don't fill it with something good, bad's going to find its way in. We've all fell victim to this. Here's some uh, biblical examples. I'm going to read them to you. You can jot them down if you'd like. Uh, Romans 13. Two verses. Verses 13 and 14. Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Watch this. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness, or in sexual promiscuity, and immoral living, or in quarreling, or jealousy. So what is he saying? Don't participate in these things. What do we call it? It was our number three thing. Eliminate it, right? Eliminate it. Do you all agree with that? Get rid of that stuff. That's not what God wants for you. It's not good for you. Instead, here's the replace. Instead, clothe yourselves with the presence of the Lord Jesus. And, and don't let yourself think, it's, he's like, don't let yourself think of ways to indulge your evil. Like, don't even think about those things. If you, if you put down the smokes, don't even think about smoking again. Now listen, well, I can't help what I think. Why would God tell you not to think about it if you have no control over what you think about? He's not a liar. He's not a liar, right? So, so he says, don't do all this crazy party and stuff. Instead, clothe yourselves with the presence of the Lord. Okay, so instead of going out on Friday night, drunkenness, picking up guys and girls and wild parties, you see it, immoral living and all that stuff, quarreling. So that's what we do at a bar, right? We pick up women, we pick up men, we get drunk, we get quarreling, we fight. I mean, that's what we do in the bar, right? So what does he say? Instead of doing that on Friday night, instead of doing that on Saturday night, amen, what do you do? You clothe yourselves in the presence of Jesus. That's what you're doing right now. You made a choice, didn't you? 
wow, so God's word must be true. Because you're living proof that it can be done right now. You've made a choice of your will to not do those things you used to do and instead clothe yourself. How do you clothe yourself in the presence of the Lord? How about praying? When we pray, aren't we talking to him? Aren't we in his presence when we enter into the throne room of Almighty God? Aren't we in his presence? Are we in his presence? The Bible says that he inhabits the praises of his people. So when we lift our hands and we worship him, aren't we in his presence? Are we in his presence when he's speaking to us through his word so we study God's word together? Are we in his presence? Don't do the crazy bad things. Instead, do this. Replace. Don't just remove. Look in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse 28. Here's some things we need to eliminate. If you're a thief, quit stealing. Duh, right? What does he say? Instead, he didn't say just stop stealing. He says, but instead of stealing, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others. So he says, don't just use your hands to, to, to go ahead and, and, and swipe something. Oh, I like this phone. That's, I'm, I'm going to keep that. You probably never get that thing back. Oh, no, it's an Android. I don't want it. <laughs> don't just use your hands for this, right? Use those same hands to go and do some hard work and give to Ricky something. Amen. And help him, right? Get him an iPhone. Get, go get him a real phone, right? How about here? Here's some more. Look, don't use foul or abusive language. So he didn't say quit talking, did he? He said replace it. He said stop using nasty language, but let everything you say be helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Right? So don't just stop talking. Don't just stop cussing and slandering people, but talk, continue to talk. Replace the bad language with the good language, right? How about down here in verse 31? Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. So what's that? Eliminate it, right? Eliminate those things, right? You with me still? Eliminate them. Instead, right, you see the replace? It's always not, it's not remove, it's replace. Instead of bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, and all other evil behavior, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Do you see the biblical principle here that's on display? And that's just a few of the lists. They're all through the Bible. Don't do this, but instead do this. Don't let there be a vacuum in your life. God's plan for complete freedom from sin is to acknowledge that you have it. Choose not to. Listen, addict yourself to sobriety. Addict yourself to clean websites. Addict yourselves to root bear. Amen? It, addict yourselves to lollipops. Addict yourself to whatever you choose. God's word said you're free. And whom the Lord sets free is free indeed. And that's not rhetoric. That's truth. And so we have to embrace our sin, acknowledge it. We don't manage it, but we choose to stop sinning by getting rid of it all and then replace that sin with something good and helpful and, encouragement, and encouraging. And the truth is up on the screen. God's people, you are free. Amen? Amen. Amen. Awesome. Let's hear it for the Lord. And let's sing to him. Amen.